stand together and turn to hymn number 267, Come Thou Almighty King.
Help, Lord. Our nation is in a mess. We ask for Holy Spirit revival to begin in our churches and spread throughout the nation that again we will truly be one nation under God. We thank you for your love, your patience, and your mercy. As, Amer as Americans celebrate Father's Day, today we ask that you help us become wise and loving fathers. For the fathers who are no longer with, with us, we appreciate them for what they did right and forgive them of what they may have done wrong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated, yes. <laughs> you still have your hymn books open. Just turn over a few pages to 271, Standing on the Promises. And yes, I know we're going to remain seated. That's okay. You can still trust God.
find in your scriptures Revelation 6, 1 through 8. And if you could please stand in the honor of the reading of God's word. Of your Revelation, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come! And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! And out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth, so that people should slay one another, and he was given a great sword. And when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for denarius, and three quarts of barley for denarius, and do not harm the oil and wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come! And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him, and they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. What's in First Chronicles chapter? Uh, well, let's see, chapters one through nine. There's a long list of genealogies. <laughs> who had who? And then they had somebody. And they're listing all the people in certain tribes, and they're calling them by name. How many of you have studied those genealogies? Not many of us, I don't think. Nor would we say to a new believer, you know, if you just spent some time in these nine chapters of First Chronicles, you'd really get mature and grow. We wouldn't do that, would we? I wouldn't do that for myself. Unless I was really looking for something in those chapters. I really don't turn to them very often. 
But I turn to chapters that have more to do with soteriology, not genealogies, but soteriology, which is what the Bible has to say about how a person is saved. And what does God do for them when he saves them? Now that's much more my cup of tea, personally. And so I trust that that is something that you are interested in and find verses that you memorize that have to do with salvation or Christian growth, what God has done for us. There's another aspect of Bible teaching called prophecy. Now this is a cup of tea for special people, in my opinion. It's not something I naturally am drawn to, but there are believers, this is where they live for. Man, they just love to study prophecy. Others, uh, even in our church, man, you talk about election or predestination. Now that's their cup of tea. And they find all the verses on it, and they are meticulous about studying those things found in the Bible on election predestination. Eschatology is very similar to prophecy. Eschatology is the last things. Now this is really encouraging because the Bible does say, what happens to an individual whose life ends on planet Earth? What happens after death? That's a good thing to know. A good thing to, say, a good thing to share with people. Not only is that part of the eschatology, the last things, what happens at the end of the age? This age that we're familiar with is going to come to an end. How is that going to happen? And what is going to replace? What's going to be the new age that follows this age? Another thing that to consider on eschatology, the end of the world as we know it. Wow. Wow. The end of this world as we know it to be, and it's going to be a totally different world. New. And then even the kingdom of God is an eschatological theme in the Bible. All that is going to be accomplished in the kingdom with Christ as the king on the planet, uh, that's a great study. And lastly is the eternal state. The eternal state is just what it sounds like. How is it going to be in eternity and that it won't change? Uh, the only thing that might change is how much we're going to learn and grow in our love for God in eternity. Forever and ever knowing new things about the Lord and growing in love for one another and for Him. So this is all about eschatology. And, you know, I have found out Christians are at different levels. Not that one level is worse than another, but some are just starting out, and, uh, and they're on a certain level, and if you give them eschatology, it's like, blow my mind. I'll never get that. And others have been Christians for a while, have really studied, and when it comes to soteriology, they, they really have a good handle on salvation. Um, so we have certain personalities in our church, for instance. And some of us just love to study certain aspects of the Bible, and others of us have other things that interest us. I had a member approach me over a year ago uh, when I started teaching on the book of Revelation chapter two. And, and this person really enjoys eschatology, uh, the final things, <clears throat> the tribulation, and so this person came up to me after I started preaching. He says, are you going to <clears throat> continue with all the churches, the seven churches? That's my plan. That's my plan. And this member looked at me straight down and says, I can't wait till you get to Revelation 3.10. <laughs> <laughs> that was over a year ago. This person has been waiting over a year for me to get to this verse. Because for them... For this person and for many others, this is a critical verse, an interesting verse, a verse that has a lot of debate and discussion about it, as I've mentioned before. I've also had other members of the church say, you know, if you just kind of move on, it'd be fine with me. <laughs> this is not what they're really interested in. They'd like to go on to another topic. And so I just mentioned this because 
as fellow brethren, each of us are gifted in a certain way by the Lord, and we want to use our gifts, and we want to encourage people to use the gift that God has given them. And if their desire and heart's yearning is to know the Lord through soteriology or eschatology, we want to encourage them. We don't want to discourage them. And so at this point, we're at Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. And I trust that you will be patient, so to speak, um, because when I get to your topic, you are going to want everybody else to be patient as we delve into a certain topic that you love to explore and learn about. Well, Revelation 3.10, are you there? Uh, I want to read it again. This is probably the eighth time we've read it, but I can't even remember all of it. I don't have it memorized, and it's just good to recall. These are the words of Jesus to the church at Philadelphia who is in the middle of great tribulation and struggles, and some are dying. Others don't have work. Uh, some are in prison because of their faith in the Lord Jesus. So he says to them, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, the hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. So just a kind of a quick summary, you see that he's in a sense blessing them for being persevering in loving him and obeying his word when it really is costing them quite a bit. And they've been faithful. And Jesus says, as you have persevered in my perseverance, I was faithful when the Jews and the Romans came at me during my years of ministry, and particularly at the end, when they put me to death, I suffered because I loved the Father, and I was going to obey His Word, and I was going to accomplish the mission He had given me, and it cost me. And just as I loved the Father and served in suffering, so have you, saints in Philadelphia. You have loved me, you have not abandoned me, you have been obedient to the scriptures, and because of that, I want to assure you, I'm giving you my word, I will also keep you from the hour of testing. And I mentioned there are different views on this verse, but almost everybody, I can't say everybody, but almost everybody agrees, this hour of testing that's gonna hit the whole world, uh, and that it's going to affect every person that dwells on the earth is the time called the tribulation. Almost everybody agrees on that. And so what it appears to be saying is that Jesus is going to keep you from this hour, from the tribulation. Um, but then there's the other view. And some say, yes, he's going to keep you, but you're going to be in it. You're going to be right there during the tribulation. And so that's what I want to discuss a little bit about this morning. The great debate about what exactly does it mean that I am going to be kept from the hour of tribulation. So there is a group, basically, they're called post-tribulationists, and they say if the tribulation is seven years, for the sake of argument, they, they don't say there is seven, but let's just say there is. Uh, they would say that believers, all the believers alive on planet Earth, are going to continue living and enter into the tribulation. And it's not till the end that Christ comes, at the end of the seven years or so, and that's when Christ comes and rescues believers in out of the tribulation. So we come out at the end of the tribulation. Those are called post-tribulationists. And then there's the second group, and I think most of you know me. I've been here long enough. I would probably be a pre tribulation well, I am, not probably, I am. Uh, I am a pre-tribulationist, which says, I believe that Christ comes and takes Christians before the tribulation starts, all right? So all the believers leave, only unbelievers are left. 
that start the tribulation. But if you have studied some of this, you know that the gospel will be preached to the entire world during the tribulation. And God doesn't fail to save all those he has planned to save during the tribulation. So there will be believers in the tribulation. But it's not, in my opinion, those who go into the tribulation. It's those who turn to Christ, hearing the gospel, the 144,000 Jews and others who will be sharing the gospel. They will be saved and they will go through the tribulation. In my opinion, they will suffer. This will be great suffering. They will not be in a bubble and be protected. They're going to experience the wrath of God just like anybody else. But you have to remember, the gospel is being preached now, and many of them could care less about the gospel. And so Christ said, well, when you're in the tribulation, I'm still going to save, but I'm not going to save you out of all the uh, horror that's going to take place. But he says to the people who are saved in the tribulation, persevere, continue with me. And if you persevere to the end, you will be saved. And there will be greater temptation there to reject Jesus. And a much easier way out, you'll have food and a variety of things that the government and everybody else will want you to have so that you will reject the Lord. But it will cost you if you continue to walk with Jesus. This is all unsubstantiated from the scriptures, just from years of learning what the tribulation is going to be like. So this morning, what I'd like to do is really spend time where the opposite camp is. Post-tribulationists. What they teach and where do they stand. And, and that's what I'm going to do this morning. Uh, you'll see that I don't agree with everything they say. They don't agree with everything or much of what I say. But we do have a lot of things in agreement. <clears throat> Post-tribulationists, as you can see, there's about five points that I'd like to cover. Uh, the first three on this list, I would say, is where we have most of our agreement. I didn't say we have total agreement, uh, but we have a lot of agreement with each other. Uh, on the first one, for instance, uh, it talks about the New Testament nowhere clearly teaches that the believers are going to be taken out of the world at the beginning of the tribulation. Now, if I just said believers will be taken out of the world, we would both agree. But the question is when? When will they be taken out? They believe at the end of the tribulation, and I tend to believe at the beginning, before the tribulation really starts. So, we do agree. If there was a verse that said, at the beginning of the tribulation, the believers are going to be taken out of the world, that would settle the whole argument. But there isn't one. And so, in spite of Revelation 3.10 being a favorite verse of tribulationists, it doesn't say anywhere, this is going to happen before. I come back, uh, or before the tribulation. And so we need to remember that's an implication, not an exact word from God. Secondly, the second thing that we tend to agree about is that God keeps believers. He's not going to lose anybody who really belongs to him. They are saved, they will always be saved. And the way that he keeps, the word keeps, it would be better to almost use the word, he preserves. He preserves believers. And more specifically in the tribulation, he will protect believers. We believe, I, I'm including you with me, is that okay? <laughs> Maybe you don't. But I'll just say most of us, as far as I know, most of us would say the way he's going to preserve or protect us is he's going to take us out before the tribulation starts. That's where I think most of us are. All right, so that's how he's going to protect. And the post-tribulationists, they say, oh yeah, God's going to protect believers while they're in and experiencing the tribulation. 
Okay, and then we're going to fine tune that in just a minute on their on their view of pres preservation and protection. So they make it very clear: believers will not undergo the wrath of God. They will not undergo the wrath of God. And we believe that is also true. We believe it because if we leave, this seven years of God's wrath won't be a part of our lives. It will be a part of the lives of those who become Christians during the tribulation. There is a fourth point, and this is where we begin to diverge from one another. Believers will suffer persecution in the last times, but only during the first half of the tribulation. So post-tribulationists would say, during, they wouldn't say three and a half years, they're not very uh, precise on the number of days or years, but they would say the first half. Christians will suffer, and, and that's why I say new believers will suffer. Because the Bible makes it clear. Believers are going to suffer during the tribulation. But they say it's only the first half. And they say the believers all go into the tribulation. And anybody else that becomes a Christian. So the first half is what they would say is a time when they will suffer. But not the second half. They would say the last three and a half. They call that specifically the wrath of of God. And they do not call the first three and a half the wrath of God. So, if you ever read anything about this, that's what they mean when they say the wrath of God will never fall on Christians. And they only mean the last three and a half. And they will have a bubble, so to speak. God will somehow protect them. And they use, if you notice the very last words on there, they use the Egyptian experience as an example. The plagues, and particularly the climax, the last one, the firstborn, everyone was going to die, and God came and he says, now you put blood from a lamb on your doorpost, and when the angel of death comes, you will be spared of all the firstborn. And so they never experienced that. But the Egyptians, they experienced all these deaths of all the firstborn. Okay, so just as God took care of the Israelites in Egypt, so in the last three and a half, God is going to protect all the believers. And when God's wrath is poured out, and let me say this much, they've got this right. The amount of wrath in the last half is extreme compared to the first half. And there is wrath in the first half. But it is extreme. And so that's why they call it the wrath of God. And they say, now Christians will not suffer during that portion of the tribulation. They'll be kept from harm in the last half. And they use Luke 21, uh, 34 through 36, as one of their reasons why they will not suffer. Christians will not suffer in the last half. And we're going to go there in a minute. As I mentioned last time, we were in this verse, no one, particularly myself, is able to clear up all the discussion, all the debate, and give you the final word. This is it. This is going to resolve. I cannot do that. No one has done that for all these years. But what I can do is point out what is black and white. What does the God say specifically in Scripture that I don't see how anyone could interpret it any differently? And I'm going to try to stick to the black and white rather than the gray. Um, I respond first to the fifth point. I want to start there. And this is where post-tribulationists specifically say believers will escape God's wrath in the second half, the second half of the tribulation, and they use Luke 21 to support that. So I'm asking you now to turn to Luke chapter 21, 
And uh, if you're at verse 5, you'll notice Jesus is walking in front of the Jewish temple. It's a huge edifice where they would worship God. And they would bring their sacrifices, the priests, and they would worship. It's just a huge temple. And they're walking by it. And the apostles hear him say, The day's coming where not one stone of this huge thing will be on top of each other. In other words, this is going to be completely destroyed. And they're like, wow, really? And so you see in verse 7, they began to question him. Teacher, when, therefore, will these things be? What will be the sign when these things are about to take place? Can you tell us? So that when we see the signs, we'll know it's coming. Now in Luke, the emphasis is first on the Jewish temple, which was destroyed in A.D. 70. If Jesus died in 33, the year 33, in the year 70, the Romans completely destroyed the temple and overtook Jerusalem. All right? So it did actually happen, literally, of the building. All right? But in this passage in Luke, Christ also includes the end time tribulation. What's going to happen in Jerusalem in the end time is that they'll be surrounded like the Romans surrounded and took the temple out in the year 70. So if you want to look that up, it's in Zechariah 14. And you'll see again, Jerusalem is being surrounded in the end time by all these nations that are going to destroy them. And Christ returns and wipes them out. That's in Zechariah 14. So both events are being addressed. You can't just say this is all about the temple. That's all it is in Luke 21. No. If you look, for instance, at verse 11. Verse 11 isn't just about Jerusalem and the temple. There will be great earthquakes and in various places plagues and famines and there will be Terrors, with a capital T, terrors and great signs from heaven. You're going to feel like the world is going to fall in and just completely fall apart. That's what he's saying. Well, that never happened in year 70. Now, it happened emotionally for the Jews, but it didn't literally happen, as it says in that verse. So Jesus is intermingling the temple destruction and the end time destruction. And some of them are very clear. You know exactly which one, like the one we just read. That's the end time. So between verse 5 and verse 19 is the first half of the tribulation. Starting at verse 20, there is an increase of issues. And Jesus calls that in Matthew the great tribulation. That's the words he uses for the second half. And that's one reason the post-tribulationists talk about the wrath of God. Jesus said this is the great tribulation. But uh, at verse 20, they talk about Jerusalem being surrounded by armies. That's the building. But if you go down to verse 27, look what happens. And then they will see the Son of Man. That's a term for the Lord Jesus Christ. They will see the Lord Jesus Christ coming in a cloud, in a cloud, with power and great glory. He's coming back, and he's going to wipe out all his enemies. So that is not in Jerusalem on the year 70. That is the end time. So we have Jesus in this chapter talking about both the first half and the second half. And when we get to verse 34, he's now summarizing. All right? But the summary is about the end time tribulation. He doesn't deal with year 70. He deals with the tribulation. So let's look at verse 34, uh, where we begin to uh, see what Christ says about it. Be on guard that your hearts may not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and 
the worries of life. And that day, that day of wrath, that day come on you suddenly like a trap. We've had mice in our home before. Have you? And my wife can't stand those things. You know? And she just goes crazy. And, and so the brave soul that I am. <laughs> I get all kinds of traps. You know, I'm going to get a bunch because I, I want it to die. I'd rather not mess with it. So when I hear, oh, that is great music <coughs> in my ears. I let them wiggle a little bit. <laughs> you know? And then afterwards, I go, I go get the thing. She wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Right? I don't know if you ladies are like that. but So there, Jesus says, there's going to be, and when that tribulation starts, you are caught. You cannot escape. It's going to go to everybody in the whole world once it happens. So Jesus says, be on guard. Now that word on guard doesn't just mean figure out when I'm coming. No one knows exactly when he's coming. He's talking about our hearts. Did you see the word of art? Where is your heart? Is your heart with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life? Is that where you're focused? The worries of life can be getting lots of money, a big house, a great education, just focused on life here on earth. And obviously there's drunkenness, there's immorality, there's all these temptations that we face every day. And Jesus is saying, be on guard that you don't compromise, that you persevere with me and according to the scriptures. You're going to obey the word of God and you are going to suffer even before the tribulation. Many Christians in our country are up in the air because our government and the people hate the message of the gospel. And, and much of that is all over the world in worse times. I mean, they're getting slaughtered in many countries because of the gospel. So Jesus is saying, keep your heart loving me. Don't compromise there. And stay in the word. Teach the truth. Live according to the Bible. That's what he's saying in verse 34. So that when that day comes, you're not going to be in the trap. Verse 35, this trap, it will come upon all, all those who dwell on the face of the earth. No one escapes once it starts. It's on the, all the earth and all the people. Verse 36, but in contrast, to the tribulation that's going to affect the whole world. Keep on the alert. Keep yourself alert at all times. Why? Because we don't know exactly when it comes. No one knows. But if you're ready, it doesn't matter what time it comes. If you are alert and you are on guard to love the Lord and obey His word, you have nothing to worry about. But let's go on. Keep on the alert at all times. An example would be praying. Praying in order that you may have strength to escape all things, all these things that are about to take place. And I, I need to stop right there. Praying in order that you may have strength. That word strength is a verb. It's not a noun. In other words, there is an action on your part and my part. At all times, we are to be praying for strength. It's the same word used in Genesis where Joseph is receiving a blessing and he is being attacked. And then after the attack of bows and arrows and people trying to kill Ephraim and Manasseh's tribes, it says the mighty one comes to help. And that's the word here. The all-powerful God acting to protect Joseph and his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So, this is a verb. You can strengthen yourself 
in the love of Christ and in obedience, that's what you pray. Oh, Lord, that I would never compromise and follow or diminish my love for you. I don't want to do that. I want to grow in my love. And in spite of all the problems that I have, financially, physically, whatever, relationship-wise, I pray I will obey and follow what you said to do. That's what he's talking about when he says this is how you're going to be strengthened. Let me put it in a word from Revelation 3.10. Persevere. That's what he's saying. Strengthen yourself in the love of Jesus and in his, obeying his word. Persevere with him and the scriptures in order for you to escape all these things. Now this is the critical point between us, I believe, most of us, and the post-tribulation. They would say the all there only refers to the last three and a half years, not to the first three and a half. So Jesus said, I am telling you, you can escape all. Now, the all is not saying the last three and a half. It, it's nowhere near there. All is all. It's going to affect all the people in all the world. And all these things that I've talked about in the previous verses, all of them, you can escape. You can escape from all these things. So to only limit it to the last half, in my opinion, is not doing logical, biblical, contextual teaching. In this context, Jesus is talking about everything he's talking about, not just the last half. And notice something very familiar. All these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So, I wanted to read to you from Revelation 3.10. Notice these words. The testing will come upon the whole world. That's what Jesus just said. The testing will come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. That, that's what he just said. So this verse and Revelation 3.12 are parallel passages. They're talking about the same thing. Same thing. But I cannot say Jesus didn't mean all when he said all. I just don't think that's logical. Uh, and so this is why I differ from them. Um, now, I will tell you this. This may complicate it. But it's, it's what they do, all right? The word escape, they interpret the word escape to be the same thing as Revelation 3.10, kept from the out. How do they interpret kept from? You go into the tribulation, and you go all the way through it, and particularly the last part, you are kept from the wrath of God. You have a bubble. And the wrath of God will not harm you. But you will be there. And you will go through it. And at the very end, you will be raptured. At the end of the seven years or so. So that's how they interpret escape. Escape means you're still in the tribulation. But you won't be hurt in the last three and a half years. You will in the first three and a half. According to them. And I'm going to have to deal with kept from... Hopefully next Sunday, God will. And this word escape. Does it really mean you're going to escape, but you're going to be in the very middle of the whole thing? You never leave. You go through it. Post-tribulationists teach believers will suffer persecution in the first half. And I'm quoting them. I'm not quoting what I... This is what they say. The persecution in the first half of the tribulation will be upon believers because 
It is not God's wrath that's hurting believers in the first three and a half. Because that persecution is from Satan, from the Antichrist, demons, and wicked persons. Generals or law people, and they're the ones that are going to hurt you. Satan, Antichrist, wicked people, and demons. That's not God. That's how they view it. That's how they view it. Um, so what I thought we would do is go to the very first part of the tribulation, Revelation chapter 6. Does it say, really, that God is not involved or that God doesn't have wrath at the very beginning of the tribulation? Like God's not involved or God is not doing it. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. And I saw, this is the apostle John. And he's been taken up into a vision to see the future. And so he says, I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as it were, with a voice of thunder, Come, like calling out the one that's going to ride on the horse. Okay. Now the very first thing I want to show you, is at the very beginning, who's in charge? The Lamb. The Lamb is breaking the seal of destruction and death and punishment. The Lamb breaks it. One of the four living creatures that surround the Lamb on the throne tells this person in verse 2, you have permission from Jesus to come. Come out. Verse 2, what does that person do? I looked, and behold, a white horse. He appears to be righteous, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, a bow for battle and war, and a crown. This man is a dignitary, and he is given... Uh, prestige and royalty and he went out conquering and to conquer this is this is death this is war and so notice Jesus breaks the seal and in a sense is very clearly directing what's going to happen and when and where this is not the Antichrist this is not a demon this is the Lord now, if we go on to verse 3, he broke the second seal. Verse 4, now we have a red horse. It was granted to take peace from the earth. There will be no peace on earth in the tribulation. And Jesus breaks this seal, and the angel says, come out, and you do this, take peace away that men should slay one another. And a great sword was given. If you look at verse 5 again, the lamb broke the third seal. Verse 7, he broke the fourth seal. And verse 8 is horrendous. I looked, behold, an ashen, ashen Lord. He who sat on it had a name, death. Death has been unleashed, and Hades was following after him. People are going to be sent to Hades when he gets through with them. They go on to die and going to go suffer. And he says authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with famine and pestilence and wild beasts. All right? This is not a pretty time. But the focus that I want you to... See, I don't see how you can say Jesus Christ is not in charge at the beginning of the tribulation. That this isn't his wrath. Yes, he is using instruments to accomplish it. But he's in charge. He breaks, they were crying before this, who's going to break the seals? And, and then finally, John starts crying. And then he's told, no need to cry. There is a lion from the tribe of Judah who's going to break the seals. And then things are settled as to who's really 
in control. So I disagree, and I hope that you understand the first half of the tribulation is still God's wrath. It's going to be augmented more, but it's still Jesus in control and showing himself in charge. So, it doesn't fit the system that they have. I think scripture teaches that they're not right in this part of the interpretation. If one of them was here today, they could tear me up on my view and show me where I'm not making sense. So, and there's partial truth about that. No one has a tight, perfect theology on the tribulation. Nobody. Because there's a lot of missing parts. But the parts that we do understand that are black and white, we have to stand there. God is in charge of the wrath from beginning to end. In Luke 24, 21, those three verses that we looked at, Jesus Christ is exhorting believers not to give in to the world, the world's ways. You look at movies, you read books, you look at the internet, the world, its interpretation and its temptations are all over the map. You cannot escape being tempted sexually, in your thoughts, with your money, um, just everywhere you turn. We are being grabbed and they hope to pull us into even feeling bad that we stand for the truth. And if you stand for the truth, oftentimes, even now in our country, they're going to let you have it. Financially, in the courts, or even beat you up. If you're at the wrong place at the wrong time, so to speak, and they, they find out you're a believer, it's not a pretty story anymore. It's getting worse. So Jesus is saying, he's exhorting, don't give in to the world's ways. Stay alert. Pray that you may have strength. His strength, His love, and, and the Philadelphian believers persevered. And, they, and Jesus said, just like I persevered, He wants you to persevere. He wants me to persevere. He wants you to persevere. Don't give in. Don't make excuses. Don't compromise. Love the Lord with all your heart. Know his word and say, Lord, help me to live with your power according to the scriptures. I don't want to give in. We too must constantly watch that we don't give in to sin and to temptations. Our flesh is strong. Satan is strong. The world system is strong. Retired pastor Stephen Cole um, once worked at this swanky, swanky hotel in Chicago. It's called the Drake Hotel. And in July of 1959, Queen Elizabeth uh, was scheduled to come and visit Chicago and stay in the hotel. Now, it was not public knowledge which hotel, okay? Part of that is security and other issues. So elaborate preparations were made for her visit, not just by that hotel, but various hotels, the upper end scale. And so uh, the waterfront along the Chicago um, shoreline, man, they cleaned it up and they were ready for a ship to dock when the queen was going to disembark. When people called the Drake Hotel asking, you know, you're one of the finest, is the queen going to be there? Well, you know, they're not allowed to say that. Then they'd have thousands of people, so to speak. But anyway, this is their response. We are making no plans for the queen. Our rooms are always ready for royalty. Always. That's how they answer it. And that's how we're to live our lives. Are you ready to see royalty? 
if the Lord Jesus appeared in the clouds today, are you ready? You know, they did a lot. You know, they, they painted trash cans before the queen came. They painted trash cans. They had the red carpet ready. Uh, they did above and beyond and made special preparations, even though publicly they didn't say they did. But they did. The finest food, everything. There was not a little detail overlooked at the drape. Because this is the queen. Is there a detail in my life, in my soul, in my words, in what I look at, where I walk to, what I read, what my motive is? Is there any detail where it's not ready for Jesus to look at? And if you remember, at the end of Luke 24, it says that you might stand before the Son of Man. We will give an account. And when we get there, it's going to be too late to try to clean up. You know, the, the time has arrived. The world is gripped with fear. There are frightening things already all over the world. Already. And they are fearful. We should be filled with hope, not fear. The Lord is on his throne. He is directing his plan. And if you love Jesus, and you've been saved by him, and you are walking with him, you have no fear to worry about all this. So, Christ is coming. Does that help you at all resist temptation? Does that help you? Do you even think about it? Does, it's supposed to help us. He's coming. I need to be ready. He's royalty. He's my savior. By any chance that Christ is coming, will it help you say no to lustful thoughts? No to how you spend your money. We're accountable in every area. Not just thoughts, money, behavior. Am I ready? He's coming soon. Did it change anything about last week in my life? The Lord is saying I'm coming. And may you and I have hearts that love him and are preparing every day to be with him and to be ready should that be the day you see him face to face Lord we're so grateful for the encouragement of your word and the truth of what is black and white and that you are calling us to be on guard stay alert the world and Satan your own flesh will take you away from me. And Lord, we hear that through these scriptures today. But we also hear, persevere. Stay in love with me. Show it by the way you live. And when I see you, you said you will. Say good, well done, faithful servant. What a joy. May we live that way, Lord. That we not just have tribulation facts, what side I'm on. As important as it is to know the truth, it's really more about you, how I'm living. Thank you for the encouragement of your spirit today.
staying together. Turn to number 275, How Firm a Foundation. 275. Dads, happy Father's Day. Thank the Lord that we have this privilege and that he is the greatest